Hello, everybody. Uh, people can hear me, please. Uh, OK, I'm going to start this session. Sorry for the little delay. Uh, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker today, Hari Balakrishnan. Uh, from an industry perspective, Hari is currently the co-founder and CTO at Cambridge Mobile Telematics, uh, which raised uh, $500 million from SoftBank LinkedIn Band. Over his long, illustrious career, Harry has played a role of advising many startups, typically created by his students at MIT. Uh, from an academic perspective, if you're involved in computer networks, network system, mobile computing, you're very likely to have come across Harry's contributions, which are highly cited. Harry has an index, H index of 125. Okay, so to give you a perspective of what 125 means, if you have 20 years research experience and you get an H index of 20, that's good. It's 40, it means it's great. And at 60, you are remarkable. Harry has 125. Uh, he is currently the Fujitsu Professor of Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT. And if you go to the website, you can, you can uh, find a lot more details on him. And with that, I'm going to get off the stream here and introduce uh, and let Harry take over. Thanks. Thanks, Harry. Take it on. OK, thank you. Uh, am I sharing my screen or are I? Uh, yeah, you can, you can go ahead and share your screen. OK. All right. Okay. So working on it. Okay, you can see it on my screen, yes, on the yes, screen, and you can hear me too. Yes, and uh, if someone can say on the chat line if they can hear him. Yes, they can see it. Good. Okay, brilliant. All right. Great. They're, they're giving you a thumbs up already. Yeah, I see that. Okay, great. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jamal, for the kind all introduction. Right. Thank all you all for inviting me to this uh, to this event. The last time was uh, in person. I was there. Was in person, Montreal. It was really, really fun. So um, happy to do this. So what I'd like to talk to you all today about, and, and really, please feel free to interrupt with comments and questions in the middle. And I think it's uh, better off as a discussion than a, than a lecture, uh, is, is uh, an idea that I've really been poking at with various collaborators and students for over 20 years, which is the best ways to do traffic control um, on the internet, and in particular, the best way in which to share information that about congestion and about performance between uh, flows or between applications. And so uh, one of the original ideas I'd worked on many years ago, over 20 years ago now, was something called the congestion manager, which looked at it, uh, sharing congestion information across multiple flows on a host. There was an RFC about it, uh, and really it didn't, obtain very much practical traction um, for, for, I'm not exactly sure why. Um, but recently, I've, I've heard from people at the hyperscalers like Google that they're very interested in uh, sharing congestion information ac across those. And I think there's a lot of benefits to doing that. About two or three years ago, um, uh, I started thinking about this problem of sharing congestion information between sites. And I'll describe what that means. And this is uh, a project that we worked on. It's uh, written up in two papers, and there's some software as well that I'll talk about later. Um, and there are three key students involved here, Frank, Akshay, and Katish, um, who've really been quite instrumental at uh, many carrying out many of the ideas here. And my other collaborators, my faculty colleague, Mohamed Alizade and Radhika Mittal, who was a postdoc and now professor at Illinois. So let me um, start with what I mean by site-to-site -site congestion control. So a site is a single physical, let me define it, it's a single physical location um, with many endpoints sharing an access link to the internet. So a common example would be a university camp uh, like MIT uh, or a campus or a company office network. Typically it would be a site. Um, and if a company is distributed geographically, then you know, you'd have many sites. Uh, and you know, also a particular data center from a cloud provider like you know Amazon's US West, for example. So if you look at this company network um, as a concrete example, uh, what you might have are many different endpoints uh, with many users. 
running many different applications. So in this picture here, there might be some interactive SSH traffic or web browsing needing low latency, uh, cloud storage backup to you know Drive or Dropbox or whatever uh, that might need pretty high throughput, but you know latency doesn't quite matter. Uh, video streaming like the or, or uh, uh, interactive video conference like this um, session right now. And a common problem that people encounter is that every time uh, Bob runs one of his storage backup services, um, SSH sessions or the video sessions might start lagging, uh, calls might get choppy, audio might be choppy, et cetera. So the problem, of course, is that there's sharing of the network resources and there's congestion happening. And if the sharing happens at this access link, then what the sites administrator, the company's administrator might be able to do is implement scheduling and implement some sort of traffic isolation at those points. But what happens if it's not clear where this congestion or queuing is happening? And over my career over the past, I've worked in networking now for 25 plus years, um, literally 27 years. My first paper was in 95. And over my career, I found that the, you know, the nature of the bottleneck Keep shifting in time. You know, um, in 1995, which was these transatlantic T1 lines that were the bottleneck, and then it shifted to the edges and back in the middle. And so, when students sometimes ask me, "Where's the bottleneck? Is it at the edge? Is it in the middle of the network?" My answer is yes, because these things change with time. And at any given point in time, you might have many different situations. And I'll show some data from other people's research about this. So the question is, what happens if the bottleneck uh, are interconnection points? That might be in the middle of the middle of the network. And the problem is complicated because the queues start building up outside of the control of the site owner, but it's their applications that are causing that they're the ones having problems, but they have no control over what they can do in the middle of the network. And therefore they have to resort to pure congestion control. And the problem with pure congestion control is that every flow or application, or perhaps an end host with congestion manager is independently doing its own processing and trying to learn what's happening, but there's really no really easy way to coordinate because I don't know if I'm on a storage backup that there's some other interactive web connection or a Zoom call happening. Now, what's interesting over the last five years or 10 years is the move to cloud computing. And now, when everything is shifted to the cloud, there's an interesting opportunity that opens up. Because even though these applications are different, typically they have endpoints. So I have one endpoint in my company's network the, or my company's site. The, typically, the other endpoint is in one of a handful, I, mean, I wouldn't say handful, but maybe a few hundred other sites. For example, Amazon US West or Google or Azure. And many of these applications end up going between the same site. So you might have a web session from, you know, from some website, an interactive SSH session where your uh, engineer in your company is gaining access to some cloud. Um, you might have some backups, but all of them might be going to the same data center or a handful of these data centers like Amazon US West. And so that might provide us a pretty interesting opportunity, even though you have all these disparate applications um, and disparate endpoints, many endpoints start into many endpoints, but the nature of cloud computing has meant that more and more applications are being hosted in these public clouds. And that might give us a pretty interesting opportunity because the way this picture works now, is if there's a bottleneck in the middle of the network, chances are that um, my SSH connection, your video conference call, and Jamal's backup might all be going into the Amazon data center in this example, even though the, these applications are being offered by different providers and the users are different and they all share the same path through the same public internet. This is the hypothesis where we have some data to back up that this is actually going on. And now we have an interesting opportunity because as a network manager and you have a little bit of understanding now where you could look at for example, IP blocks of where these uh, destination RIPs are there and aggregate them. They're all going into Amazon US West, for example. They're all coming from your company and you might start, you might have the ability to now start sharing information across these flows and start scheduling so that 
interactive traffic is prioritized over um, the backup traffic, for example. But we still have a problem. The problem is where's the bottleneck? So I've now shown this bottleneck queue that's been shared by all these applications, and I've just shown it in the network somewhere. We don't know where the bottleneck is. Um, so because we don't know where the bottleneck is, um, we do, we're not sure whether the company's administrator can actually manage it. So you might have a bottleneck queue where the latency sensitive apps are stuck waiting, and now we have to do something about it. So if that bottleneck is on the access link connecting your site, your company's site to the public network, then, well, there's a solution that presents itself. You could put a scheduler there, you could prioritize, you could isolate traffic, and you get traffic control between your site and the uh, data center that all of these different disparate applications happen to be um, originating or terminating at. So of course, in this example, I've shown it for traffic originating from the site going into another site, but obviously the other side, the other way also works. There'd be a, you could put a scheduler on the other side. But the problem is what happens at the bottom of, is in the middle of the network, anywhere in the middle of it, not at the end, uh, end site that you have um, direct control over. And in general, you won't know where the bottleneck is. Of course, you could observe the queues and see if it's at your, at your site, but in general, you know, it might be anywhere and you might not have control. What happens if it's over there? Um, then the queues start building up here. You know what you need to do with your traffic, um, but you don't have control over some ISP in the middle of the network who's transiting your traffic and probably is transiting other people's traffic too. And the problem is that now the queue at, that you control at your company's site is empty because that's not where the bottleneck is. The queues are building up wherever the bottleneck is. And we don't have the ability to put a scheduler in the middle of the network, as I mentioned. Moreover, this bottleneck could shift around. We don't know where it is. So, you know, in principle, you'd have to go and put it in at all these different places. But we have a problem because you don't have the site administrator. You know the policies you want to exert on your traffic, but you don't have the ability to put the mechanism inside this bottleneck that might be in the network. And the ISP sitting in the network doesn't care about your specific traffic decomposition. They might think of you as a user, as an aggregate. And frankly, if it's in the middle of the network, they don't even know who you are as a company because you buy internet service from somebody and they peer with somebody else or they buy service from somebody else. And all that ability to discriminate traffic is completely lost. And moreover, now with all the encryption that's happening and everything, it's very difficult to even do sensible traffic control. So not only is it, uh, Policy-wise, impossible for someone in the middle of the network to know what it is you want for your users' traffic. Um, the mechanism doesn't even exist. Moreover, I mean, uh, uh, more and more these days with encryption and all sorts of tunneling and other types of protocols that are in place. No longer is the world just TCP. There's Quick. There's lots of other protocols, and all of them are encrypted. So, what are we to do? I want to take a step back for a second and just summarize the problem make sure we're on the same page. You have a bunch of traffic going between your site and another site. The fact that these sites have become the granularity of traffic is really a result of the move to cloud computing, both on-prem cloud computing, but really public cloud computing. So all sorts of companies are now offering services from a relatively modest number of data centers in the cloud, and those data centers are doing some sort of you know, rate control for your uh, organization. Uh, and oftentimes the bottleneck the hypothesis here, which I'll back in a minute, is that oftentimes the bottleneck is not at the edge. Um, no one in the middle of the network can implement the policy that you want. And moreover, with all the obfuscation and encryption that's happening, you know, the people in the middle of the network don't even know what flows there are, what application any given packet or flow belongs to. Uh, and they might not even know the, have the ability to distinguish between different flows. Um, so what are you to do? And you at your site don't have a queue to schedule the bottleneck in the middle. So that's the uh, problem. What we would like is to be able to enforce a scheduling pro a policy for your traffic going between your site and another site. But often you don't control where the bottleneck uh, are and where packets. So that's the um, that's the problem formulation. So I'm going to pause here to see. Is there any questions or comments before I continue and move on with 
talking about some of the ideas and and, and how we can, we might approach this. And I don't know the protocol for questions. I, I think there's, I see a Q and A um, tab here, so maybe you can post, or I don't know if you can say something if you would like to. Uh, audio yeah. wise, I don't know if that works. Uh, Harry, we we the protocol is people either post uh, yeah. on the Q and A section at the top right corner, the second row in the bottom. Okay. Or uh, they raise their hands, and then we will monitor it here, and uh, I'll ping you. Okay. All right. Thanks. So is there any question? Yeah, of course, everybody will say that traffic is important. So the point here is not about every application. The um, point here is that as a sites administrator, what policy do you want to exercise? So as a sites administrator, the idea is that you can, you have the ability to say my video conferencing traffic has to be isolated from my backup traffic and so on and so forth. So we would like that this, this is a solution intended for the site network administrator. So it's not really giving that power to the endpoints. You know, so Jamal might say his backup is more important than my Zoom. That we're taking that out of the equation. Jamal and I in the same site, same company, the site's administrator decides. And you know, we can back channel and bribe our administrator if we want. But ultimately, that administrator is the target um, user of this proposal. Right, so it certainly seems to be that we want to be able to understand where the bottleneck is. So I'm going to talk about how we change the problem so we don't want to get into where the bottleneck is because if the bottleneck is in the middle of the network, no matter what we do, you know, Verizon isn't going to allow me, uh, you know, at my company to go and figure out uh, uh, what to do. So I'm going to start repeating the questions. I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah, how to find the right queue control is absolutely correct uh, point. And how do we um, figure out what the bottleneck is or where the bottleneck is? That's that's a valid point. That's a, that's one approach. We, yeah. Did my sharing disappear, by the way? It, oh, it's back. Isn't the bottleneck mostly on the network side? Well, I'm going to talk about where the bottleneck might be. I'll show you some studies that people have done. When you say network side, do you mean in the middle of the network, uh, which is what I'm interpreting? or the edges? The answer is both. And there are many cases where the bottleneck is in the middle of the network. You hit the point on that. So the bottleneck is in the middle of the network, but I want my policy to be at the end or on my site. How do I? So that's really what I'm going to be talking about. So let me jump into um, describing some of the ideas here because you, you have all hit the nail on the head. So where are the bottlenecks? So the answer is the bottlenecks are in a bunch of different places. Right. So. I want to repeat Sanjay's question here. What happens when traffic is tunnel and encrypted? It'll be hard to do any scheduling in the middle of the network. You're absolutely right. We want to not do scheduling in the middle of the network, but yet we want to handle cases where the bottleneck is in the middle of the network. So that's what I'll talk about. So where are the bottlenecks? So there's a very nice paper from a couple of years ago. Uh, 40 to 50% of the persistent congestion for WAN traffic originating from Microsoft Azure was in the middle of the network. It was not in the autonomous systems, either near the client or near Microsoft. So that's an example of where this is real persistent congestion. Um, uh, another paper from SIGCOM 18, Damdere et al. found that many measurements they showed of interdomain congestion. In fact, the top title of the paper is something like uh, persistent interdomain congestion. And an interesting one recently, just, just I read recently published last year, was transnational link. They found that in uh, connections between China and the rest of the world, a lot of the bottlenecks are happening not in the edges. And in fact, um, they're happening in ISPs that are not at the edges, in, to use their words, deep inside the great bottleneck of China, which is kind of something that they can't. The title of this paper actually is something about the great bottleneck of China. And there were papers from a few years before from MLab uh, showing many bottlenecks at ISP interconnection points as well. So this is a real thing that the bottlenecks are happening often in the middle of the network. So even assuming it's 40 to 50% of the time based on this Azure paper, it's not a small amount. So here's the key idea. Um, the key idea is we're going to shift the queue. So these bottlenecks are in the middle of the network and we're going to talk about how to shift the queues to the site's edge where we have the ability to control it. So that's really the intuition that we're gonna go after. So here's the idea. We're going to figure out a dynamic way to rate limit traffic from the edges 
so that we are rate limiting in a way that the queues start to build up at our edges and not in the bottleneck. And the question is, how do we do that? And it has to be dynamic because the cross traffic in the bottleneck is going to be varying as well. So what we need to do is shift the queues because the only way to start doing scheduling and traffic control with our traffic so that my Zoom traffic can get priority over Jamal's backup uh, is to have some sort of queuing build up at the edge. So we need some sort of rate limiter there so that I can move, so that I make it look like my access link is the bottleneck, not the middle of the network. Then the queues start building up there and I can put my scheduler there. So how do we pick the right rate? And it has to be dynamic. Um, so let me show you an example. Let's say that the bottleneck in the store example is 10 uh, megabits per second in the, in the network. That's the actual bottleneck. And we rate limit at our site to less than 10 megabits per second. Like somebody tells us it's 10, of course we have to measure it, but somebody tells us it's 10 and then we rate limit to less than 10. Well, queues are going to build up, that's great. But of course the problem is that we're going to waste uh, resources, right? Because uh, the queues are going to build up, but I'm not utilizing the full 10 that's available to me. So that's a problem. But let me now, suppose we make the rate at which we send at the rate limit be more than 10. Well, then we've done nothing because our queues are going to be empty and the bottleneck is going to fill up um, at the 10 megabit bottleneck link and then we gain nothing. So the challenge is this. We want to maximize our throughput so we get the 10 that we deserve, but we want the queues to build up at our edge, just enough queuing so we can start to schedule so the traffic we care gets prioritized or isolated. So it's the self-inflicted queuing delays. The self-inflicted means all the traffic that self-inflicting delays on each other in my site that I want to isolate from each other, that I want to prioritize. So I can't rate limit too low because then I don't utilize what's available. I don't want rate limit too high because then of course the queues don't build up. So that's the challenge. And you know the interesting thing about this question, if I get it to be exactly 10, then what will happen is, of course, the queues will start just exactly 10, slightly less than 10. Then the queues start to build up where I want it. But now, suppose you have five megabits of cross traffic that comes in. Somebody else sends traffic and builds up to five megabit per second. Then, of course, what I need to do is make sure that if I keep it at 10, then the bottleneck becomes back in the middle of the network because the link was 10, but there was five cross traffic. My traffic was five. I'm rate limiting to 10 my queues no, don't build up anymore because all the queues build up in the middle. So I have to now get to learn that this is about five megabits per second so that now the queues start building up again at my site where I can control it. The point being, this has to be a dynamic problem because I'm reacting to traffic from other people as they come and go in the middle of the network. And here's the key point. Congestion control, abstractly speaking, end-to-end -end congestion control, not network level traffic control, but the end-to-end -end congestion control protocol that the community has worked on for three decades, actually have the same problem. They aim to calculate the rate because ultimately congestion control is deciding whether I should send a packet now or not. And what they're entering is a window or a rate of transmission. Except today in the architecture, we do it at the end point and we do it per connection, or maybe we do it per host if you have congestion management. We don't do it in the site. We don't do it in the middle of the network because we don't have a control loop with feedback built in with acknowledgements and so forth in the middle of the network. But congestion control, end-to-end -end congestion control with feedback algorithms like TCP acts or quick, et cetera, is exactly solving this type of problem with a twist. I'll talk about the twist in a minute. So what we would love to have is congestion control ideas be implemented on a site-to-site -site level but yet we don't want to get into the middle of doing end-to-end -end congestion control with end-to-end -end TCP in the middle of the network because we want to preserve those end-to-end -end quick and TCP connections. You know, maybe with TCP, we can flip the connection and do TCP proxies and add complexity, but then we won't be able to use that approach to work with Zoom, which might use UDP-based protocols, or Quick, which might have encryption and other capabilities. So we want to be careful in how we achieve this end-to-end -end feedback control on a site-to-site -site basis. So that's the architectural question. So to do this, 
we have a middle box proposal. Uh, it's a middle box. It's a lightweight middle box that's going to sit in the site edges, and we call it the bundler. The bundler is because it's bundling traffic, and then it's applying ideas related to congestion control onto the bundled traffic so that we can dynamically calculate the bottleneck billing for the bottleneck rate for our site's traffic and send at just below that rate, like an epsilon, epsilon amount below that rate so that queues start building up at our site edge. And then we isolate the traffic to deal with the self-inflicted queuing. So at least insofar as the throughput available to me as a site is concerned, I am able to prioritize what's needed for my site. And I am able to isolate what's needed for my site as the administrator. So the bundlers implemented would be implemented as two lightweight middle boxes that are sitting at each site edge. And we built a prototype of this, the software on GitHub, I'll point you to at the end uh, of the talk. And um, its job is to exercise site-by-site -site traffic using ideas from congestion control sitting in the middle of the network. So I'll define a bundle. A uh, bundle is going to be defined, is defined as a set of flows with endpoints in the same pair of sites. Now, there are many ways in which you could automatically infer when traffic comes in which bundle it belongs to. Um, a typical approach would be to use an IP um, block aggregate like a slash 24. Um, and the assumption here is that the traffic in the bundle all goes through the same bottle. Now, this is an assumption or a hypothesis. And now, of course, there has to be some measurement to validate it. So we have done a bunch of experiments using a tool called Scamper, which is a uh, which is a tool which allows you to send traffic to a variety of different IP prefixes and learn what routers they're going to and learn something about what sort of bottlenecks they might be sharing. Um, and what the uh, what we did was we took thirty different data centers from Amazon, Google, and Azure, and we connected to five thousand randomly selected IPv4. Um, I think it was IPv4, um, 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 uh, network blocks, slash 24 blocks, and investigated whether those slash 24s had hosts that were sharing the same bottleneck or not. And what we found was that in all cases, the same autonomous systems are being traversed to those slash 24s that we probed, which is a good sign. So at least they're going through the same um, uh, autonomous system levels. And in about 75% of those connections, uh, of those slash 24s, they were sharing the same um, bottleneck. In about one quarter of the cases, they may have been sharing the same bottleneck, but what we found was examples of ECMP multipath load balancing, where in the middle of the network, there was at least one instance of traffic in each of those prefixes, at least one case where hosts within the slash 24 were being split across different links within an ISP. And in those cases, we cannot guarantee that the bottlenecks are shared. And what the algorithm I'll talk about will do is detect cases like that. And in those cases, it will not do anything. So the bundler will not function in those cases. It will automatically detect those cases and say, look, I'm not actually going to control the traffic. You'll just, your performance will revert to whatever is happening on the internet right now. But that said, I should say that if load balancing is being done with ECMP or other mechanisms in the middle of the network so that traffic belonging to the same bundle, i.e. between the same two sites, is going on different paths, if the load balancer is good, then it will have the property that the traffic load across those load balance paths will all equalize. Otherwise, you have a bad load balance. So I actually believe that the algorithms here, if the load balancer in the middle of the network is good, the algorithms we're proposing will also work. But investigating that is not something that we've done uh, so far with respect to uh, how it really performs. Uh, so right now, it just will detect it and say, I'm not going to do anything. So what is it planning to do? So. Um, in practice, of course, I showed you a picture with one site. In practice, you'd have a bundler where your company might be communicating with a bunch of hosts um, for different applications in US West. It might be doing stuff with Oregon. It might be working with Dropbox's data centers. And each of those might be using different paths. They might share some link um, going into um, different uh, sites. And in this architecture, for each bundle, which again, I'm going to define as a set of flows with endpoints, 
same set pair of sites where you could interpret the site to simply mean your company to different US West, US East, Oregon, Dropbox, you know, every little data set, every data center that you might communicate with, regardless of who the application provider is. That defines a bundle. And so you'd end up with a picture that looks like this. And each bundler is going to have a separate queue and a separate dynamic rate limit per bundle. With the idea being each bundle will build up just enough queuing to do traffic isolation, but not so much queuing that it is the bottleneck. So it's going to track the in-network bottleneck, but it's just going to shift the queues over to the edge. And a bundler is structured as a send box, which is on the sending path, and the receive box, where it's going to be counting some, I'll show you how it counts packets or counts the amount of traffic and provides feedback. Each receive box sends feedback to the send box in a very lightweight way that will allow for congestion control type ideas to run. But this is not TCP. This is not quick. This is not, uh, you know, some UDP based protocol where um, we're looking and terminating application connections. The application flows are end to end. They can use whatever mechanisms they want. And we're not even sniffing on, uh, you know, like, TCP port numbers and things like that. We're not doing anything of that kind. I'll, I'll describe that. So let me now get into what the bundler architecture itself looks like. So you have a send box and a receive box. And the receive box is going to provide us feedback, typically a few times every round trip time, you know, one to four times per round trip about measurements of what the send boxes traffic is being, you know, how much traffic it, it's seeing. And the idea here is if the rate measured at the receive box is lower than the rate of the sender, then what will happen is that you will infer that there's congestion. And so dynamically, the sender's rate will end up um, um, lowering. And if the receive box is Sending feedback of the round trip time and its received rate that indicates an absence of congestion, then the send box will slowly start to increase its rate akin to the way congestion control works. And that's what the congestion controller does. And then there's a rate limit. And the most interesting thing about this architecture that uh, I'm personally the most proud of with, with how we built it is we do this and have implemented this in, with Linux QDIS. And we've also done it with, we've shown how to do it with uh, programmable router hardware without sitting in the data path. So the measurements and the congestion controller is running without touching the packet. The packets are being enqueued into queue disks automatically. And what the congestion controller does is each of these traffic blocks, uh, each of these uh, uh, bundles gets put into a set of queue disks. So for a given bundle, you'd have a set of queue disks. And the congestion controller will set a rate limit on the queue disk. It just tells Linux, hey, this is the rate limit you should use for the queue disk. And then lets Linux do its thing. And all it's doing is the control with respect to telling each queue disk what its rate needs to be. And it's relying on the queue disk to do the rate limiting themselves. And I think this is a very clean architecture because then we've been able to leverage all of the functions that exists in both hardware routers, but also in Linux as a router, and can make uh, leverage multiprocessor capabilities and things like that, DPK, all of that capability that people are using for software routers to essentially make these middle boxes run even in software at extremely high speed. So the measurement scheme for congestion control is uh, has a few principles. We're going to leave connections intact. So the traditional way in which you might do this is to start. TCP proxying and quick proxying and adding a lot of complexity. And it really isn't a good path, in my opinion, because um, increasingly there's a lot of encryption. And frankly, the moment you start terminating things, then you're responsible for delivering it reliably and there's a lot of complexity. We also don't touch or modify the packet. This is important because these applications have worked really hard to work through NATs and firewalls and everything else. And Anything we do to the packet header, even adding or modifying a single bit in the packet header to do signaling, may cause it to break with NATs and may cause it to screw up firewall functionality, you know, getting through firewalls and so on. So a principle here is we're not going to touch the packet. We're not going to di disrupt the end-to-end -end connections that exist. And we're going to provide a way to provide out-of-band feedback between the bundler's receive box and the send box, typically a few times every round trip time. 
And we're going to sample the same packets at both the send box and the receive box without explicit communication. So this is key because we need to know if the if the rate at which the rate limit at the sending bundler is that too high, too low, or just right. And to do that, we need to have some feedback coming from the receiver. The way we're going to do it is that the receiver is going to measure the number of packets within a period of time and inform the sender how many packets it received and the delays, the round trip that was measured and the round trip variation that was measured. Uh, the, sender, uh, the sending bundler will use this information to measure the round trip and the round trip variation. But the receiver is simply going to count the number of packets within an epoch. We don't want to signal the epoch by putting something in the packet header, although with IPv6, we could probably do it with you know, some extension header. But we want to make it work today with minimal changes to the packet because we want the packets to flow at high throughput without our software getting in the way. So the way we'll do this is to synchronize based on a hash of a portion of the packet header on either end. So if the hash of an invariant part of the packet header, which isn't going to change, so we won't use IP ID and things like that, which don't exist in IPv6, we'll use certain pieces of the packet header and hash it, and the hash matches a certain outcome, then We'll use that as the epic boundary and count back and provide this feedback without any communication. And that allows the sender to learn whether the rate at which it's transmitting is too high, uh, is too low relative to the rate. Of, in other words, the no congestion, in which case it'll try to increase the rate, or if it's congested, in which case it'll try to reduce the rate limit. Or if it's just right, in which case it'll keep it just as is. So compared to alternatives like a TCP proxy with an end-to-end congestion control, uh, we have low overhead and really low complexity. In the worst case, if there's a bug in our software, we can disable it and nothing changes. The traffic just continues to work. So we can be very conservative in when the bundler's algorithms run. The moment the bundler feels like it's learning something that it doesn't understand, it just stops applying its policy to the QDIS. So traffic will just continue to flow. If our software fails, it doesn't matter. All it means is the QDIS doesn't get updated and the status quo will just continue. So it's a, it's a really low overhead, low complexity way to, to do something like this. It's a very simple data path. In fact, we're not changing the data path. And I think increasingly important to transport independent. It will work with bespoke transport protocols people build atop UDP. It will work with protocols they build atop TCP, you know, that they might do, you know, various types of things on top of TCP. Uh, it'll work with Quick, um, and frankly, it'll work with all sorts of tunneling uh, protocols as well. So now the question is, which congestion control algorithm should we use? And this is a really, really important question because the congestion control algorithm that needs to be used cannot be an algorithm like Cubic or TCP AIMD. Um, or in fact, it can't be BBR either, except if we were to tweak BBR, which we can talk about later. What we need is a delay sensitive, delay controlling algorithm. The reason why is, although it is true that congestion control solves the problem of inferring a rate, many congestion control algorithms solve that problem by causing queuing to happen at the bottleneck like Cubic or TCP IMD or frankly BBR, even, uh, even BBR, because it tries to you know, kind of make sure that it doesn't lose throughput to TCP Cubic in paths where it shares the bottleneck with Cubic. So it drives the network to congestion. And typically these schemes maintain, uh, you know, perhaps a bandwidth delay product worth of buffering inside the network or something in that order of magnitude. So what we want is something where we are able to estimate the rate without driving the queues up. And delay-based congestion control algorithms provide that capability. There are schemes like uh, Vegas or FAST or COPA, which we published recently, that's now being used uh, in a certain part of Facebook. But the problem with delay-based congestion control schemes is that when the cross-traffic in the network is something like Cubic, then the delay-based congestion control scheme, like on Vegas or any team that tries to control the delay is going to get screwed because the buffer filling traffic is going to drive up. The delay-based scheme is going to detect an increase in the round trip time and conclude that because the delays are increasing, 
congestion is happening and slow down. So the buffer filling algorithms will obtain throughput at the expense of delay-based congestion control algorithms. And so what we want is a delay-based controller that only operates when the cross traffic is not buffer filling cubic-like traffic. And when that happens, we enable it and we can do self, and then the queuing for our site is all going to be self. And there's a paper that I'll point you to at the end, which shows that not only how to make this thing work, but more important, which I'll describe the idea, but more importantly, in the network today, there are often many times when the traffic, cross traffic is not buff filling. Cases where you have many short web flows that come and go. It's only when you have long running TCPs that the cross traffic with cubic that the cross traffic is buffer filled. So what we want is an elasticity detector. Elastic means long lasting buffer filling cross traffic. And we've designed such an elasticity detector. I want to give you the basic idea here. And for those of you with an engineering background and electrical engineering, I think you'll be quite uh, amused by the approach that we take to do this. The problem we're trying to tackle is to determine whether the cross traffic is at clock buffer filling cubic like cross traffic or AIMD like cross traffic versus cross traffic that's just kind of inelastic, which is somebody clicking on a web link, a bunch of data comes in and then the next traffic comes in or it's application limited TCP where you know it's limited by the, the receiver window size. So congestion control doesn't get to exercise. So effectively it's running like constant bitrate traffic with small variations. It's not filling up the buffers in the middle of the network. So to do that, what Nimbus does is observe, use these rate measurements that I showed you where the receive box is giving some rate measurement to the send box about its track. And what Nimbus is doing is using observations of the rate at which the receiver, the receive box is receiving traffic, comparing it to the rate at which it's sending traffic. And it's going to determine, number one, what is the cross traffic? How much is it? What is the rate of cross traffic? And number two, is the cross traffic elastic or not? Is the cross traffic likely to be caused by buffer filling P or buffer filling congestion control? Or is it likely to be caused by just some inelastic random traffic or application limited CBR like traffic? Or traffic that's frankly bottlenecked somewhere else. So when it comes to our bottleneck, it's not buffer filling. It, it looks like it's coming in at a constant rate. So here's the idea to estimate the rate of cross traffic. I, I, you know, this is a simple idea, but I've never see, seen it be used. And so we think it might be somewhat new. It, it's a very simple idea. So let's assume we estimate the bottleneck link rate mu. That's the actual rate of the bottleneck. Um, and you could estimate with packet trains, and there's been a lot of papers published and practical tools available for estimating the bottleneck rate. So we're gonna assume we know it, it's mu. So if you have a sender controlling a certain amount of the traffic of the bottleneck, say 20% or, or more of that bottleneck, uh, it doesn't have to be 20%, it could be less, but the more the better. Uh, and you're trying to estimate the amount of the cross traffic. And here we're gonna assume that the cross traffic and you share the same bottleneck. So if something like fair queuing is being implemented in the network, the assumption is that you and that sender are going to go through the same queue. If you're in different queues, you're already isolated from each other, so we're not gonna worry about that. If you're going through the same queue, then if you send S and you receive R and you're trying to estimate the cross traffic Z, then we know that S, which is your traffic of trans your transmission traffic divided by S plus Z, which is the cross traffic, which you're trying to estimate, has to be allocated in the same proportion as R, which is your received rate divided by because the rate at which you your proportion of the arrival should be equal to your proportion of the departure when the bottleneck is completely used. And so you have this equation, S over S plus Z is R over mu, from which you can estimate Z, which is your cross traffic estimate, you solve for Z here. And that gives you a cross traffic estimate that only depends on your sending rate, your receiving rate, and knowledge of the bottleneck, which you can obtain through a packet train approach. Of course, this is an estimate because your estimate of mu might be noisy, your estimate of the receive rate might be noisy, and so this is an estimate. Yeah, it does assume mu is stable. Is that observed to be true is a good question. I think it's true when you don't have a cellular wireless link. So on internet paths, we've observed it to be, to be quite stable, but 
I'm talking here about time scales of round trip times, right? This is the calculation that's running round trip by round trip by round trip. So of course, mu is not going to be stable if you look on an hourly time period, but this is a dynamic algorithm. And on a cellular wireless or even a Wi-Fi link, you wouldn't use this algorithm. This is intended for sort of wire and optical or fiber type bottleneck. Now, here's the beautiful idea for those who are signal processing or people with a engineering and not computer science background, you'll be tickled by this, which is that we're going to take our transmitted data going through the send box. So let's say that you have your, your congestion controller says you can send with a congestion window of 2000 or a rate of you know 200 megabits per second. Don't send it at a constant bit rate. Don't pace at a constant bit rate, but instead modulate the transmissions on a sinusoidal waveform. So there's a sine wave of a specific frequency, um, which uh, uh, we have a paper that talks about what frequency should be. So I'll just call it FP. So all that means is it's a pulse frequency. So we're going to transmit it with a pulse. And these pulses are a pretty interesting idea these days. So BBR uses pulses of square waves. We've kind of experimented with various types of pulses. And I think there's an advantage of square pulses. But the frequency response of a square pulse, as you know, sort of disperses. The idea here is to use a sinusoidal pulse with this characteristic pulse frequency. And the, what you see in this picture here is if the cross traffic is elastic, what happens is it reacts to the sinusoid. So when you go according to sinusoidal waveform and the cross traffic is elastic and buffer filling, it's reacting to your pulse. And using this equation, when we observe the time series of these cross traffic Zs, and plot it, you observe a sinusoidal waveform if the cross traffic is sinusoidal. Well, I'm sorry, if the cross traffic is elastic. But the cross traffic is not elastic. That is, it's a bunch of short running flows or application limited traffic or what have, or just Poisson arrivals or any inelastic arrivals. Then you see the picture on the right. You send according to sine waveform, but the cross traffic estimate time series just looks completely uncorrelated with that sinusoidal waveform. So what our algorithm does in Nimbus is to look at this thing and take the Fourier um, transform, the FFT, which we can implement, as it turns out, quite quickly on, you know, on even a laptop. So we take the FFT of this cross traffic estimate and look to see whether it has a pulse type behavior. And the blue line here shows what happens with elastic traffic, and the orange shows what happens with inelastic traffic. Of course, these are noisy estimates. So you can use this to come up with a metric, which we call the elasticity metric, which looks at the magnitude of the peak of the FFT at the pulse frequency that you transmitted and divides it by the maximum frequency between your frequency and double of that frequency everywhere else. And we look at that ratio. So when you look at that ratio, what you find is in this picture, you can vary this. Um, um, you, for varying amounts of cross traffic and your own traffic, um, what you find is that there's a threshold that you can pick, and this could be tuned, where um, when the traffic is mostly elastic, if this calculation is above this value, in this case two, then we can reliably conclude, or with high probability conclude, that the bulk of the traffic, more than half of the cross traffic is elastic, and then you don't try to control the delay on the bottleneck because it's a losing proposition. All that's going to happen is your throughput drop. But if the cross traffic is elastic, then you can get the best of both worlds. You can run your traffic at the highest possible rate you're allowed to, but control the delay so that it's not in the bottleneck, it's at your edge. And you win because you can now isolate your own traffic uh, and have your own policies run on this cross traffic. Uh, we have done these experiments on a bunch of different uh, ways in, in which you might implement a congestion controller in the sandbox. I'm going to start with uh, this picture here, which shows that you start at time zero and um, you have a 96 megabit per second link and you have um, 16 megabits per second of cross traffic at the beginning. Then you add in a TCP connection, a long running TCP cross flow from between some other pair of sites, and you have a 16 megabit connection. Uh, 16 megabits of inelastic traffic, and you increase the number of TCP connections and vary the inelastic traffic as well. And the black line, the dash, the, the uh, uh, solid black line shows what the actual throughput 
that your bundle should be achieving. And the dot edge shows the delay. And this is the delay in the middle of the network, not at the end. So when you have cross traffic, which has TCP, there's nothing you can do. So you have to turn it off, turn off your delay control mechanism. And what the dash plan shows is those cases with Nimbus, when we run our algorithm, you know, the delays remain high in the middle of the network because there's nothing you can do. The cross traffic is using TCP, but we're able to track the rate properly. But then when the cross traffic goes away from TCP and only is inelastic, we're able to detect that and we're able to keep the delays in the middle of the network really low, shown in this dashed line at the blue da uh, dashed line at the bottom. The, all the other schemes that we use, so we've run Nimbus not only with our delay algorithm, but also with COPA's delay algorithm. And it also does pretty well. But now if your bundle traffic uses cubic, it doesn't work because the delay is always in the middle of the network. If it uses BBR, what we found is that, and this is well known now, depending on the bandwidth delay product and the round trip time, BBR could beat the performance of um, what we consider the fair share rate, which we estimate as what cubic obtains. Now that, you know, that's just a particular type of fair share rate. You might say, well, BBR is itself better. And of course, then you want to try to emulate BBR rather than cubic. But the point here is it doesn't maintain low delay. That's Right with a bunch of other schemes. Now, COPA is a scheme that came out of, uh, that I worked on with a student of mine. It, it also has a mode switching method, but that's more heuristic and not as sophisticated as the Nimbus. And it actually switches modes a lot. These grays are when it is switching between elastic and inelastic. So it's making a lot of mistakes. Although on average it's doing pretty well, it's making a lot of mistakes in its mode switching. So the idea of using uh, Fourier transform and signal processing seems to be. I think a robust idea that's worth um, investigating further. So I know I have five minutes left, so I'm gonna skip into some performance results. Let me just show you one performance result of what happens when we run this. Um, we also have run a number of internet experiments on real pads, and what we found is that in about 80 to 90% of the pads between data centers, this scheme improves um, the performance by about 57% in flow completion time um, for the flows that we care about and isolates the traffic from each other. That's sort of a practical in practice result. Now, of course, there are trillions of internet paths, so you know, these are quite preliminary, you know, smaller scale experiments between about 30 um, data center locations and maybe about 20 different hosts. So it's not like a massive scale experiment. But this was an experiment in emulation using the Mahi Mahi emulator. Um, we took traffic from the CADA backbone, um, uh, including a 1 million TCP cubic flows that were sampled from that backbone, and analyzed it. And what we found is that um, in that the majority of traffic in the traffic trace were small flows, uh, less than 10 kilobytes. There's a bunch of medium flows and a, uh, you know, a handful of very large flows. Of course, a lot of the bytes belong to the larger flows. And we looked at the distribution of flow completion time. Um, which is one metric for how good the quality is um, in terms of your isolation and traffic control. So I'm going to plot here the slowdown, which is the flow completion time normalized by the size of the flow to account for the fact that a larger flow will always take longer to complete regardless of congestion. So the goal of the experiment was to create a situation where a queue is building up in the middle of the network and then show that Bundler can automatically shift that queue back to the sending site to enable traffic isolation and scheduling. So, you know, to demonstrate it, you send a bunch of small, medium, and large flows, configure the bundler, and then we compare it against using fair queuing with the throttle to ensure that the small flows in this ideal situation, like if you could control, if you magically know where the bottleneck is, you run FQ cardal there or SFQ cardal, and you see how that performance compares. And then I want to show that how does this bundler architecture compare in performance to this idealized, but I think unrealistic architecture because deep in the middle of the network, who knows how to control that traffic because you can't exercise your policy. So um, we're plotting the flow completion time over the flow size. So first, if you do nothing, what you see here is a slowdown that's about 1.8, almost two. Um, in the median, the bar shows the 25th and the 75th percentile and the edges of this whisker, this is the 90th percentile and that bottom is the 10th percentile. So 
What you see here is that the tail is pretty bad. It could be slowdown is as bad as a factor of four for the small flows with the median nearly two. And then for the medium flows, the slowdown is more than four. And for the large flows, the slowdown is uh, even higher. So now I'll show you what happens when you put in a fair queuing um, algorithm with queue management uh, like Caudal in the bottleneck. And what you see is the slowdown for the small flows is pretty much non-existent because that's what you'd expect. It totally isolates it. And the medium and large experience of slowdowns are shown here because obviously they are getting hurt at the you know, expense of these smaller flows, which is what you would expect. So now when we did the bundler algorithm, what you find is a result that looks like. And what you find is that the median slowdown with the bundler without all the speculating and cardinal in the middle of the network is actually quite close to optimal. It's a little bit more spread on the small flows, but both the medium and large flows don't suffer adversely compared to not doing anything, it's a lot better. And now you can exercise the scheduling policy that you want. So you can decide as the site administrator that if your Zoom is more important or your video is more important or your whatever is more important, then you can exercise that control even in, a, in an even greater way. So um, what I talked about here, this is my final slide, is uh, this architecture for site-to-site -site control that takes this idea of really lightweight mechanism in the middle of the network and comes up with a way to do delay-based control without all of the complexity of what you do with pure end-to-end -end control. There's no you know, uh, termination of connections and acts and so on. And a key is this elasticity detector that's trying to determine the rate and the nature of cross traffic. So you know when to exert the control and when it is futile to do so because the cross traffic isn't really behaving that well. And so the software available here, um, the, the software has been, um, uh, results have been reproduced by a third party as part of the Eurosys conference program and the artifacts are evaluated and available. So I think it's very usable by people. It actually, this paper won the uh, best artifact award at Eurosys. So I actually feel like this is a great credit to my students, Frank, Akshay, and Pratish, Pratish for a really good um, work from a prototype perspective. And there are two papers here that you could look up that describe the details of the scheme. So with that, uh, I. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for your attention. We'd love to have a discussion with this time for that. Uh, yes, th there is time. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Let's uh, give him a thumbs up. Uh, so th there's a bunch of questions, but what we'll do is I'm not. I'm, I'm wondering if we should bring them on the stage. I'd also like to test these buttons. <laughs> yeah, bring them on the stage. You know, okay. what's okay. life without so, a uh, The first one is from Vikram. Okay, uh, that's the question is up here, and I'm gonna invite him on the stage if he wants to show up. Vikram, you there? All right, there's Vikram. Hey. I don't see him yet, but he says he's joined the stage. All right. Yeah. Okay. Do you, the question uh, may have changed since you. I, I I noticed some questions were asked before you said something, and the answers may have changed. The question may have changed. So do you, go ahead, uh, Vikram. Are you there? I'm I'm trying to get on. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. We, yeah. Hey, Harry. Um, awesome work. I just want to understand. What happens in real life when people don't rate limit? Um, would it be something um, you worry about? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So um, the question is, they may or may not rate limit. The point is that in the beginning, when it gets deployed, you know, everyone is not going to be using Bundler. So a few places are going to be using Bundler. The other people are not going to be using Bundler, right? Uh, in those cases, we want to identify what is the nature of the cross track. And whether the rate limit or not, the point I'm making is that the key here is, can you control the delays so that you move the queuing to the edge and then you can access that control? So that in order to move the queues to the edge, your controller cannot add queuing in the network. It has to be delay sensitive. So the nature is whether or not somebody rate limits. We don't worry about that question. What we worry about is whether their traffic is buffer filling or not. 
Because if it's buffer filling, then all we can do is detect it and then try to compete without our rate limiting idea. But if they're not buffer filling, which we found a lot of cases in practice, is it is not buffer filling. Because, for example, when you run from a public cloud, the public cloud is rate limiting. Every public cloud provider rate limits a customer. So we found that because of that move to the public cloud, this seems to have worked really well when you take public cloud connecting to all sorts of um, different client sites, company sites. The idea, I think, has become perhaps more plausible than it might have been 10 years ago. Agreed. And maybe they charge for the incoming traffic. That could be another that, aspect. That's right. That's another aspect of it. And, uh, but ultimately, the goal here is how do you, as a site owner, network administrator, take more control of your traffic so your users at least do not self-inflict and screw them over through each other? That, that's really the goal of this work. Understood. Thanks. I don't know if there are, uh, Jamal, would you like to traffic cop this? Because I'm not able to see exactly what's happening. OK, uh, there was a question earlier, actually, from Michael Richardson, which asked uh, if you're using FE Codel. I'm assuming the QDisk, you're using some sort of rate limiter QDisk, like TBF or HTB, or you don't, you don't know the answer to that? I don't know which specific QDisk was being used. I know we've experimented with a few, and we picked something that did a good pacing. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, but that's not a that's not a fundamental decision. Okay. I think what would be really good is any hierarchical queue. This structure would be the you know would be the ideal thing to be using because what you want is to say here's my traffic. I have a total amount that I'm controlling, and then I have some policies for the individual things. Maybe there's class based queuing or something like that on the queue list. So that would be the ideal structure. But we're pretty agnostic to it. The the only principle we adopt is we don't want to sit in the middle of those packs. We want our controller to not be on that pure data path. OK, makes sense. I'm going to hand the mic to Shrijit. Has raised his hand here. OK, Shrijit, go ahead. Uh, OK, sounds like you can. So um, anyway, I mean, basically, the idea, it seems, sounds like that. Let me, tell me if I got this right. You're basically building virtual circuits between your bundler endpoint. And on every virtual circuit, you're effectively using an FFT kind of scheme, at least for the elastic stuff, to find out if you have interference or you have complete control over your circuit. And if you have complete control, then it's just a scheduler on that port. Is that the right summary to walk away with? Yes, except not that you have complete control. There is other traffic, but the other traffic is not going to be filling the buffer so you can control your delay. So everything you say is right. You're creating this lightweight virtual circuit not sitting on the data path. There's no signaling. Right. Completely implicit. Everything you said, I agree with, except complete control. You actually have not complete control. All you're trying to figure out is whether if you control your traffic, with can you get high throughput at low delay so that you can build up the queue at your end? That's all it is. So right. there could be other cross traffic. As long as it doesn't fill up the buffers in response to congestion or try to constantly fill up the buffers, you're good. Right, right. So, so that's that FFT sort of, uh, well, it sounded like the inverse balloon yes. algorithm that virtual machines use. Right? You're, you're trying to sort of figure out if your impact, your traffic is impacting somebody else to see if we're having a problem. So I got that part. The question I really wanted to ask was, uh, so in this model, it sounds like the receive bundler sampling rate is going to be fundamentally the most important factor for the stability of the end-to-end -end system, right? Like if you have a, for, and I think you said a couple of times per RTT, which yeah. I guess for the 100 megabit type schemes is probably okay, but if you start looking at gigabit speeds or or higher, I think you're going to end up, my, one of the thoughts, I don't know if it's correct or not, one of the thoughts is whether there's a stability concern here, because you may end up with some crazy sampling artifacts or undersampling artifacts, which leads to sort of a feedback loop that will lead to some railing, right? Is that is that a risk that you guys looked at? Was that a concern? Yeah, it's yes, but not related to the throughput. It can scale to very, very high throughput because what matters is the round trip time scale. It's I a see. function of the fundamental propagation delay. So I see. 
if you told me, is this scheme, I can, can I use it in my data center, which has 10 microseconds of propagation delay? I'll say, well, no idea. Because I don't know, I mean, fundamentally, yeah. you'd have to change the architecture, but we're talking about wide area links with 10 milliseconds or more, uh, typically 50 milliseconds type propagation delay. So in those cases, it, this is fine because we're talking here about counting over scales of multiple milliseconds. Totally makes sense. Okay, and you hit the nail on the head. I was trying to see if there is a way to match that into data set of problems, right? Because in some sense, the problem applies in a microcosm. You could call this a pod to pod relationship. You could call this a rack to rack relationship. It has all the yeah. same problems to, to a large extent. And yeah, so I was absolutely trying to... right. We have not we have not looked at the data center case. I think it'll be pretty fascinating to see whether the cross traffic related data centers is usable, it benefits from these ideas or not. Um, um, but I, I, I don't make any claims as to whether this will work in a data center. Uh, from a fundamental standpoint, you're right. You'd have to sample, you'd have to do it at a microsecond scale. Um, but I think it's an interesting research area. I, I don't want to make any claim. <laughs> I'd probably yeah, I, be wrong if I claim something. I, I will follow up with you offline. I think there's, there's a very clever part to this that may be very interesting. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, should I pick some questions from here or? Sorry, uh, I was on mute. Uh, I said, uh, those questions have been answered already. The ones that are on the QA. But if anybody else has questions, please uh, post on the Q&A or raise your hand, then we'll bring you on the stage. Um, a question for, for you all. We'll see if anybody else has questions. Uh, I, I wonder if you can set, uh, talk about any possibility if this was deployed somewhere, like a, a production environment or even an experimental uh, environment other than the what, what you did for research. Uh, I would love to work with people on this meeting. To, um, if you're interested in this or this makes sense for anything you're working on to deploy it, you know, universities are about ideas and companies and, and other organizations like that are about real production deployment. So I would love to see deployment or at least experiments and understand use cases. Um, that's why the software is there and available and we're happy to help people, you know, use it and test it out. Sounds like there's a very good fit for say SD1, right? Like an, an SD1 kind of environment where branch to branch going through some cloud or some provider. Yeah. Exactly. So it's both cloud to branch as well as branch to branch, I think would benefit that. We've, some, we've done some experiments, but they're really lab experiments, right? Like I, we've used, I've used it for my house and so on, but this is not real, real world experiments in any, the ideal is a company that is, you know, has communication with a bunch of other, um, with, with public clouds and, and so on. Uh, I suppose you could use it in a home setting too, but. Yeah. I think a lot of thinking has been targeted around company campuses, university campuses, uh, people who may be connected from home, but via a company VPN. All right. Uh, on the cloud, this would be what? A VM typically is where the receiver box would be? Yeah. Right, a VM, okay. Uh, the control protocol, that's, I guess, something simple, maybe of a TCP, the one you... No, it just sends UDP packet. UDP. Uh, it just works across the... Yeah, it just periodically sends a UDP message. So I could send a TCP too, but it just sends right. a UDP. All it's doing is counting something. Yeah, and, and it's it's, a, it's basically across the same uh, link as the data path. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it just says, I, I know. Uh, yeah, this is a good point. So you need to know upfront the IP addresses of the sender box and the receiver box because this is sort of explicit, right? You know the receiver box, you know the send box, and uh, at that point you could just send a message directly to a well-known. Uh, port running, running the, uh, the running the bundler software. So it doesn't have to go back along the same path because all it's doing is telling the send box, you know, how many packets it received in this epoch, and so that's that's all that happens. So it, it, the assumption here is send box and receive box know about each other, mm -hmm. and in the future we might have automatic discovery protocols, but right now we've assumed that 
they just know each other. Yeah, and probably you can have a control protocol which will help. Yep. Yeah, it'll start to look like RSTP or something like that. But those, those all add complexity. But I think they exist. These, these discovery protocols exist today. We should probably, we could just leverage something. Yeah. Anybody else with a question? Um, the code is available on the GitHub. Uh, I, I will, we'll, uh, we'll get access to your slides and make them available. Yeah, send them to us. Yeah. And, do, uh, do, I have a question. Is there a way to get a list of the participants or people who have the session or is that too late? Uh, some have left too. already, but yes, yeah. we, we try to be to maintain a lot of privacy, but we can give you an uh, account and uh, yeah, we, we can provide yeah. some information. Okay. Right. Yeah, my goal here is to try to engage with people who are interested in this. So if people wanted to contact me by email or um, uh, yeah, by email, I would really love to see how whether this is useful at all. Is it okay to share your access uh, uh, information with them with yeah. uh, anybody who asks? So anybody who yes, wants to. Please. To reach out to uh, Hari, uh, you can you can ping us afterwards, and we'll, or post on the people's mailing list, and we'll uh, we'll give you access to to Hari. Well, uh, let me see if there's any more questions. All right, we have 15 minutes ahead of schedule. Uh, yeah, uh, if there's no more questions, uh, let's give it up for Hari, please. Uh, you know how to do this. <laughs> thanks, Harry, and uh, thanks for. I know you're very busy. You made time for us. We really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully, uh, we'll see you again at our conference. This won't be the last time. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you all for attending. I, I love to engage with people interested in this. I see a bunch of familiar names on the, the participant list. So it's really too bad we couldn't see each other in person, but uh, really yeah. looking forward to the next one, hopefully in person. Yeah. So to everybody attending, you can actually go and mingle. If you go to the lounge, you can grab a table. A, ta a table can sit up to 50 people, and you can chit chat. I don't know if you have time, Harry. Maybe you could show up there, grab a table. Yeah. Uh, so go to the lounge and uh, and just uh, grab a table. Maybe give it the table a name. Harry is here. <laughs> OK, I will try to do this. You, you okay. make some assumptions about my tech capabilities. So let no, me... no, you, so we, we'll, uh, we'll end the session and then. Oh, you'll uh, end it. OK, good. Right, right. OK, okay. I'm going to. Yeah, I'll be gonna... at the log. Thanks. OK, I'm going to end the session here. Thanks. Okay, bye, Thanks, everybody. everybody. Bye.